Hi, Miss Coburn's class. Um, I don't actually know if Miss Coburn is making us present these or showing them, but in the event that she is, just a disclaimer, I know I am talking into a headset. And yes, Miss Coburn, I should have borrowed one of the microphones that you had offered us, but I thought I had one and apparently we don't. And it's Thursday night, so this is what I have. Please don't judge me. And the glasses help me read, so don't judge me either. And I know I'm wearing a Harry Potter shirt. Please don't judge me. I don't really, I don't care at this point. Anyway, so without further ado, Francisco Franco's fascism. During the late 1800s, Spain suffered from economic and developmental lag as compared to her European neighbors and the United States. Causes related to the crisis originated from weak monarchical leadership and unorganized efforts to practice new policies of government and society, such as universal male suffrage. So basically, Spain had passed all these new progressive policies, but wasn't really using them. In 1931, Spain established a second republic after the Republicans won the election, and King Alfonso the 13th abdicated. Short-lived was the Second Republic, typical, I hope, uh, coming to an end in 1937. In 1936, the Spanish Civil War, led by General Francisco Franco, slowly disintegrated democracy. Just three years later, Franco's coup d'etat set him in place as dictator of Spain. Franco Franco ran Spain under a fascist military dictatorship for 36 years, causing separation within the country and between Spain and other nations. Before the takeover of Franco, problems ran deep within the political system of Spain. A liberal constitutional monarchy had been established in the late 1800s as a means to progress Spain, a country that was still behind in industrial development and societal unity. Unfortunately, liberalism was stained with a weak social base and corruption. Rural peasants, slow agriculture, agriculture and little education leading to poor literacy was rampant in Spain. Thus, strong support for liberals was desolate much of society being unaware of central political issues. So basically, since people weren't learning anything new, they were stuck in the past. Isn't that how it always is? Um, as for corruption, instead of allowing fair elections to elect official position leaders, monarchs assisted people to the top and others bribed and lied. So corruption and all that fun stuff. In 1923, King Alfonso XIII was forced to abdicate to Primo de Rivera, a major influence in the army during the Moroccan battle. Spain had always been in charge of Morocco, and Morocco was like, ah, we want independence now, and so they were fighting the two countries, or a country and a country that wanted to be a country, and they what is it? Morocco lost. Typical military dictatorship has patterns of being ultra-conservative and often very nationalistic. But Rivera was flexible and provided public works and even ended the Moroccan rebellion. When economic hardship strikes a country, order is disrupted and society tends to be fearful of the future. Like in Germany after the Treaty of Versailles, the people were starving and inflation was ran so rampant, money was virtually useless. Thus, society wanted someone who would rule with strict order and get everyone's lives back on track. Oh, sounds like Germany. And especially save them from starvation. So when the Great Depression in 1930 hit Spain, Rivera's rule was in trouble because he could get enough because he couldn't get enough support from the masses that were hurting from poverty. Much was, much was of Spain. Hmm. 
much of Spain was divided, the northern regions demanding independence. That's the Basque country. And Catholicism was conflicting with secularism, an issue that was holding Spain back from moving forward in politics. So came the end of Rivera's provisional government, replacing him was the Second Republic. At this point in time, the Spanish people were feeling suspicious of any form of government they were being ruled under. The monarchs were not to be trusted, and Rivera, despite not being a completely horrible dictator, abided by his own arbitrary rules and had been able to support Spain and had not been able to support Spain during the economic crisis. Even as the Second Republic was established, every party had their doubts, for the First Republic managed to last one glorious year. Um, Anti-Catholic sentiments were the most prominent issues of the Second Republic. Moderates were in favor of a government with some Catholic influence, but radical and socialist parties stood strongly against the Church. Within the... Within this separation were further separations of left and right ring wing groups. Mm. Polarization based conflict would end the republic. Public opinion could not be unified. Lack of unification combined with the weakening effects of civil war was the key to the Second Republic's undoing. July 8, 1936 marked the beginning of the Spanish Civil War. Francisco Franco entered the Spanish infantry when he was 14 years old, later becoming best known in his career for leadership of the Moroccan battles. In 1931, when the Spanish monarchy fell, democracy-pushing liberals, wary and suspicious of military pro-monarch sentiment, denoted Franco's powerful position. Building up military support, Franco staged a coup, and in 1939, Franco was named Jefe del Estado, head of state, and Caudillo de España, leader of Spain. Okay, so this first primary source is a piece of Spanish propaganda. Uh, It's a poster against Nazi Germany. So... That means it was leftist, and it was during a time when Franco was trying to come to power, and it was those who were against him trying to come to power. And so, if I can get this, and I'm really sorry that it sucks so much. I don't even know if you can see that. But, yeah, so um, basically it's like the Spanish soldier knocking down a Nazi. And that was a piece of propaganda to use against the right wings. Um, Later, Franco, too, would control propaganda and newspapers becoming his own personal tool of gaining control of the masses and molding public opinion to be in his favor of his regime. So, like other dictators, he used propaganda to gain support and shape how the public the public's point of view on certain issues um and then oh and then the secondary uh, these lovely chart things right here refer to charts comparing the great depression unemployment rate of the u.s and spain And so the one on the left is the U.S. And the one on the right is Spain. Exciting. Um, They both, like unemployment for both rose around the same time period. So in like early 1930s. Fascism meant everything was about the state and for the state. Thus, the individual was not emphasized, but the masses and needs of the nation were top priority. Franco had the labor charter passed. The state was responsible for providing people with work and therefore a means of income. 
but in actuality, this was a euphemism, the labor charter, which assigned people mandatory jobs in order to increase the economy more efficiently. The jobs were not necessarily for the people then, they were for the state. Even though there was a difference between an owner and an employee when it came to this charter, they were both like seen on the same level or the same social level in the eyes of the government. So it didn't matter if you owned a, a business or if you were working in a business, the government assigned you to this job that you had and therefore you were kind of all on the same level because you all had the same people dictating to you what to do. Um, along with Franco's dictatorship was the Cortes, the which was Spanish Parliament. Franco had seriously restricted the abilities of the Parliament in that they did not have the authority to participate in legislation, so basically just a bunch of guys sitting around doing nothing. Policies they could vote on were limited to policies passed only by Franco, and they couldn't even vote against him. So Parliament was just kind of like a bunch of cheerleaders. All they could do was root him on and everything he did. And so it was under the constituent laws of the Cortes that Franco initiated these restrictions and gave himself the right to dismiss and replace whomever he chose in government. Besides all this, the law of succession passed in 1947 gave Franco a lifetime rule unless he otherwise stepped down. The law of succession also made Spain officially and powerfully a Catholic country. And the church basically... That meant like the church was giving legitimacy to his authority, Franco's authority. If the Pope thought he was okay, so should the people. And also gained the support of many right-wing citizens, as Spain had always been ruled as a traditional Catholic monarchy. In quotes. The law on referenda, also issued in 1945, was a further attempt by Franco to make his regime appear less arbitrary. Franco's dictatorship was attempted to be disguised as benign totalitarian rule, and so to wane rebellion, the law on referenda created the appearance that the people still had the right to have a say in government, while Franco in reality was gaining more political power for himself by decreasing the authority of legislation, legislative and judicial branches. So this law on referenda was like a mask. It made everyone feel safe, but they actually didn't have a say in the country at all. Uh, in effect, the executive branch made up of only Franco now had total control over all aspects of the nation's political system. World War II in Europe was a hotbed of dictators and what today is seen now as inhumane forms of leadership. Spain, well, I guess that's not right because some places still have dictatorships, but those four dictatorships in particular were inhumane. Anyway, uh, Spain was not the only dictatorship. So Germany, Italy, and Russia, they had Hitler, Mussolini, and Stalin. Since Hitler appeared to be taking over all of Europe, it is a wonder how Spain ended up staying neutral during this period of World War II. So, block quote. The conservative view is that Franco's dealings with the German dictator were pragmatic based on what was best for Spain and that he skillfully kept Spain neutral during the Second World War. So, the conservatives would say that Franco just wanted to stay out of the war because he just wanted to do what was best for his country. While the left view is that Franco was far closer with Hitler and admired him greatly and would have s come into the war on Hitler's side had the terms been right. So basically had Hitler set up a nice agreement some people would argue Spain would have entered the war on Hitler's side. Basically, conservatives would say, yeah, so basically, what was I going to say? Oh, I'm bringing a lot of repeating information. 